I was uh, reading this blog posted by an individual from Winnipeg, Canada. And uh, he was writing about his thoughts on Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Mona Lisa. And here's what he writes. Few paintings throughout the world are as well known as da Vinci's Mona Lisa. The image is also one of the most reproduced of any other. With up to six million people visiting her in the Louvre every year, she is considered the most famous painting in the world. It is surprising for many viewers then when they find themselves underwhelmed by the experience. Guides at the Louvre have noticed many people walk away confused, perplexed, and even frustrated. Many go home complaining they didn't get out of the experience what they had hoped. What was all the hoopla anyway, they wonder, and some never give the mysterious lady another thought. The reasons for this are fascinating. Her very popularity and the resulting mass reproduction might contribute to over-familiarity. In an odd twist, the very fame that leads to the many copies makes the original unremarkable. Yet, people still buy the posters and t-shirts because the fame of the picture has become more of a draw than the artwork itself. Few things illustrated this better than when the Mona Lisa was stolen and thousands lined up to stare at the empty space on the museum wall. Uh, the writer then goes on to say that he believes that the same thing is true with Jesus. That like the Mona Lisa, Jesus is famous around the world. In fact, he's probably the most famous person who's ever lived. But like the Mona Lisa, people often figure that, well, they've got a pretty good idea about who Jesus was and what he represents. However, their familiarity, most of the time, is based really more on a reproduction of Jesus, of what other people have said about Jesus. Or, their understanding of Jesus is based on incomplete information, which is common when people kind of pick and choose the things about Jesus that they find to be more appealing, and then they just sort of disregard the rest. Now, I think this is true not only of Jesus, but really with God as well. And when people are confronted with the God of the Bible, as he's presented in the text, they too often walk away confused and perplexed and maybe even sometimes underwhelmed because the God of Scripture does not fit into this nice little box that people so often want to put him in. Case in point, during the month of September, I was teaching the youth Sunday school class and we were going through the life of Moses, part of which involved this Scripture passage that we read this morning. This is kind of the catalyst for this this message. Uh, the general storyline is probably familiar to many of you. Israel is in bondage in the country of Egypt, and they've been there now for about 400 years. Uh, they originally went down to Egypt due to the severe famine that hit the land of Canaan uh, during the time of Jacob, and we'll be looking at Jacob as well a little bit later on. Uh, now, their stay in Egypt, although it began hospitably, eventually turned to the worse as Pharaoh began to use the Hebrews as a source of slave labor. And this goes on for some period of time, for generations. And eventually the cries of Israel are heard by God, and he sends Moses to deliver them from their oppression. And it's through Moses that God liberates Israel through these mighty plagues that are brought down upon Egypt and through the parting of the Red Sea by which the Israelites are able to escape from the armies of Pharaoh that are pursuing them. And now they're out in the desert, making their way through the Sinai Peninsula until they reach Mount Sinai, which according to this version of Israel's exodus, uh, one possible site for Mount Sinai is down near the number eight circled in black. Um, that's maybe the physical site of, of Mount Sinai. The actual physical site has never been definitively established. So now Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the law of God for some time. I mean, it's been at least 40 days, according to Exodus chapter 25. And the text says that the people began to get restless. Where is this man, Moses? they ask. Their patience begins to wear thin. How long is he going to take? 
Why are we here? What are we doing? This is boring. So someone has this bright idea to melt down their jewelry and to make this golden calf to worship, and Aaron complies. They even declare that this is the God that brought them out of Egypt. I mean, it's a little bit hard to overstate how dismal this scene really is. I mean, just mere weeks after being led out of oppression and slavery in Egypt in this great display of power and justice by their God, we see the Israelites having this party around a golden calf. While Moses descends from the mountain to witness this spectacle, and God is livid. In verse 10, he says to Moses, Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. And what follows is remarkable. And in my opinion, it's also confusing and perplexing. I mean, it's one of those instances where Scripture reveals something about God that doesn't fit into this box that God is supposed to fit in, at least not in my mind. Moses talks God out of destroying his people and out of starting over. And God actually changes his mind. And what's even more fascinating to me is to to look at how this happens. Listen to how God describes the idolatrous and rebellious children of Israel to Moses in verse 7 where it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. God is so fed up with the people that he doesn't want anything to do with them. He takes no responsibility for them. They're Moses' people, not God's. And Moses responds in verses 11 to 13 by almost chiding God when it says, But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Moses reminds God of his call and of his covenant with these people. He says in a sense, you called these people, not me. You made these promises to them, not me. You have bound yourself to them, so you can't abandon them now. Moses appeals to God's own reputation and to God's own promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then comes verse 14. Uh, To me, maybe one of the most striking and challenging passages in all of Scripture. It reads, Then the Lord relented, and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Literally, it means God changed his mind. And this whole exchange to me brings up all kinds of challenging questions. I mean, how can an all-knowing God change his mind? How could God be so eager to wipe out these people that he made this covenant with? Why does God seem so viciously angry in this scripture passage? And is Moses shaming God into acting as God ought to act? I mean, does God need reminding of his promises? I mean, these are troubling questions to me. And while there are some theological responses that can be mentioned, at the end of the day, there really are no easy answers. And for many people, this makes us a little uncomfortable, although I don't think that's necessarily bad. In his book, Reason for God, Tim Keller made the following statement. Now, what happens if you eliminate anything from the Bible that offends your sensibility and crosses your will? If you pick and choose what you want to believe and reject the rest, how will you ever have a God who can contradict you? Only if your God can say things that outrage you and make you struggle will you know that you have gotten hold of a real God and not a figment of your imagination. You see, for a large portion of Christian history under the influence of Greek philosophical assumptions about perfection, theologians have considered the idea that God could be moved or changed or influenced by human beings as being unworthy of God. If God is perfect, they reasoned, then nothing can be added to or subtracted to God from God. If God could experience emotion or change, that would mean that there was something that was a part of God that wasn't previously there. God doesn't need anything from anyone, the argument goes. He exists 
in eternal completeness and perfection. But see, I find that scripture has more than one reference to this idea that God wants his people to engage with him in this way. To question him. To be real and honest with him. And that God is affected through his interaction with his people. Uh, There's one particular scripture passage that I think is very telling about all of this. It's found in the book of Genesis, chapter 22. And it it involves the character of Jacob. And I'm going to go ahead and read through the scripture passage and then talk about it or break it down a little bit. It reads, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Now this story is odd for a variety of different things. I mean, for one, this guy shows up, and he and Jacob just start wrestling for no apparent reason. I mean, normally, right, in our world, things like this go down when one guy or the other kind of insults the other guy and then it all gets started. But we're not told any reason as to why they just started wrestling. They just just start wrestling. And what makes this even more odd is that this man was apparently no one other than the Lord himself. So Jacob is wrestling with God. And that's weird. That's odd. But what's even more strange is this man is unable to overcome Jacob. Although he has the power to throw Jacob's hip out of socket just by simply touching it. So this obviously means that he could have ended this wrestling match much sooner if he chose to, but for some reason he chooses not to. You see, there's something within this encounter that God is trying to teach Jacob. Something having to do, I believe, with this idea of continually holding on to God, continually wrestling with and striving with God. The wrestling is important for Jacob. And when he successfully holds on to the man throughout the night, he is eventually rewarded with a blessing in the morning. And then the man changes his name from Jacob to Israel, which is no small thing. Because in those days, a person's name was meant to reflect their character. And the name Israel has this meaning of one who wrestles with God. One who strives with God. So now you've got to think about this. Because the name of God's people will eventually become the Israelites. And if your name is meant to be the trademark of your character, then Israelites would be the kind of people who wrestle with God. Who strive with God. And if you read through the Old Testament, that's pretty much what you find. Israel's always wrestling with God. Now, quite a number of times it has to do with their own stubbornness and their own sin and things like that. But what this passage hints at, and others, is that there's this good side, this positive side, to wrestling with God. And as I said, if you look throughout the pages of Scripture, there are a number of prominent Israelites who wrestle with God. Abraham argues with God over the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God tells Abraham he's going to destroy those two sinful cities. And Abraham says, what? You can't do that. You're the Lord of the earth. You're supposed to do what's right. There are innocent people in those cities. And so they have this conversation. As we just looked at the account of Moses, he has this encounter with God where he wrestles with him and keeps him from destroying his own people. Moses tells him, you're going to ruin your reputation, God. 
You have to stay true to your promises. You have to remember the covenant that you made with your people. David is constantly wrestling with God throughout the Psalms. Where are you, God? Why is this happening to me, God? Why are my enemies persecuting me? Why aren't you acting, God? The Psalms are filled with David striving with the Lord. Job wrestled mightily with God as he sought an answer as to why all of these calamities and afflictions came upon him. If you read through the prophets in the Old Testament, maybe probably basically all of them, but prophets like Jeremiah and Habakkuk, they're not afraid to go to the mat and wrestle with God, and God doesn't get offended by that. The Israelites, as their name implies, strive with God. They wrestle with God. But you see, I think you have to understand, I don't think this is just an Old Testament thing. Paul calls the church in Galatians chapter 6 the Israel of God. So that speaks to me that as the new Israel of God, it's okay for us to wrestle with God. In fact, maybe we're supposed to wrestle with God. Maybe God wants us to wrestle with him. You see, my overall sense from this is that God is a personal being who is and always has been affected by his interaction with human beings, the bearers of his image. Our God is a God who relates to his people. And to be in a relationship means to change and to adapt, to accommodate, to grow, and to learn. Now, we may be a little uneasy about attributing these kinds of things to God, but I actually believe the Bible gives us permission to do so. God has bound his own joy to us and our choices. The gospel accounts say that heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. God has opened himself up and allowed himself to be influenced by human wills. God has allowed us to play a part in this grand story that is unfolding. We're not puppets, nor is history or even our own lives this blueprint that's already been mapped out for us. And none of us should be all that surprised by this, because we know this from the realm of our own human relationships. Whether it's our relationship to our children or to our siblings or to our friends, or to our spouse. I mean, whatever. In order to open ourselves up to love, and to be loved by someone else, we also open ourselves up to being hurt, and to being inconvenienced, and to having obligations placed upon us, and to realizing that there's more to consider than just ourselves. And in this really mysterious kind of way, I think the same thing is true with God. If God wanted to exist in glorious Trinitarian perfection forever, he didn't need to create the world. He didn't need to create human beings. But God chose to create and therefore opened himself up to the joy and the pain and the delight and the sorrow and anger and frustration and most importantly, the love that can be experienced when we enter into a living relationship with someone else. And part of being in a living relationship involves this whole idea of wrestling. You know, when I look at my relationship with God, uh, there are a number of things that I wrestle with, uh, with God. There are a number of theological issues that I continue to wrestle with and have wrestled with for some time. I look at parts of the Old Testament, and honestly, I have a hard time dealing with with all the violence that occurs and that's often condoned and even commanded by God. I have a hard time integrating that into my understanding of God, especially when I compare that to the revelation of God in Jesus Christ into the life of love and sacrifice that he lived. I mean, how, how do you reconcile those two things? That's an issue I continue to wrestle with. Another area that I honestly wrestle with is the traditional concept of hell. If the experience of hell is really this place where people have to endure this conscious, eternal torment 
and anguish forever. I have a problem with that. I got to talk to God about that. I got to wrestle with that one. Now, maybe for some of you, your areas of wrestling aren't so much theological as they might be personal. I mean, why did God allow that person to die? Or how come God doesn't heal me of this disability? Why isn't God answering my deepest prayer to find someone special in my life? Why did God allow that abuse to happen to me when I was a child? Why was I born with this orientation? How come God doesn't empower me to overcome this addiction? Or how come people talk about the experience uh, of, of God's presence, that God's in this place and that you can feel his presence, but I don't. We sing about joy, but I don't really experience that in my life. We talk about love. I'm not even really sure I experienced that. These are legitimate questions and areas that I think we have every right to wrestle with God over. The sad thing I found is that because people lose heart or maybe lose interest or become pulled away from the things of this world or because the church has often presented real faith as being the absence of doubts and struggles, there are many people who have just simply given up. Many people who just stopped wrestling with God. And I think if we were honest, that's a temptation that everyone here has felt to one degree or another. Uh, several months ago, I was watching this uh, movie, Moonrise Kingdom, that I thought might make, up to the, make it to the lineup of movies that we were going to go over in our movie series in August, but it ultimately didn't make it. However, there was this one scene that stuck with me. And it has to do with this topic that we're talking about this morning. This movie centers around this young boy who's an orphan. He's never really had a home, never really had any friends, and he's part of this organization that's like the Boy Scouts. They don't call it that probably for legal reasons, but it's, it's the Boy Scouts. And they're on this week-long camping trip to this island. But none of the other boys really accept him. They all make fun of him. He doesn't really fit in. Well, long story short, at the end of the movie, the boy's foster parents have decided they don't want him to come back to their house from that camp. So they basically disown him. And things haven't really gone well for him at this camp, and so he decides he's going to take his life by climbing up to this clock tower and jumping off. Meanwhile, this character played by Bruce Willis, who lives on the island, has befriended him, and uh, their relationship has grown over the course of the movie. Uh, they seem to have this special connection between them. He convinces social services to let him become the boy's father without going through, through this expedited process. So he races over to the tower in the midst of this storm and tells the boy this news. But even before he really has a chance to answer, Lightning hits the tower and the boy falls off the ledge, but Bruce Willis is able to grab his hand just in time. And as he's dangling there over the edge, Bruce's character knows that unless this boy chooses to grab his hand back, he's not going to be able to save him. So in this moment in the movie where there's this storm that's raging all around, all around them, there comes this moment of relative silence where Bruce looks this boy into his eyes and says, don't let go. Now, it wasn't that great of a movie moment, per se. I mean, I don't think people in general would necessarily be all that moved by that particular scene. But for me, those words struck a chord in my soul. And it has a lot to do with what we're talking about this morning. I mean, because of the struggles that I was dealing with and, and really, honestly, still continue to deal with, it was almost as if God himself were saying those same words to me at that moment. Scott, don't let go. Keep wrestling with me. Hang on to me. Don't quit. Don't let go. Because you see, it's through the wrestling that we discover more about God probably than through any other means. It's through the wrestling that we will sometimes receive a blessing like Jacob did. 
It's through the wrestling that we come out the other side a changed person. Jacob was never the same person after that encounter with God. Physically, he would walk with a limp for the rest of his life, but he was changed in more ways than just that. So wrestling with God is not a bad thing. Just because one wrestles with God or argues with God or even gets angry with God doesn't mean that you've lost faith. In fact, I would say it's evidence of your faith. So we should never be afraid as a community to wrestle with God in these ways. And I think there's going to be times in all of our lives where God is going to look us in the eyes and say, keep wrestling with me. Stay with me. Don't let go. Let's pray together.